So welcome to Agribusiness Matters. My name is Venki Ramachandran. Agribusiness Matters is an endeavor to discover system thinking in food and agriculture in an age of runaway climate change. So today we have a, a very special guest, a unique guest, probably, you know, we, we tend to typically call people who are working in the, in, the, in the industry in terms of food and agribusiness there. But I think today we have a, a, a special guest who sort of had a very high-flying career in, in the world of fashion and, and one day dropped all of that and, and moved into the, the slow lane, I suppose, uh, of sustainability and, and, and creating change at systemic levels. Uh, I mean, you have a very illustrious biography, so I'm not going to read the formal introductions of, of, of your biography there, but I'm just going to uh, simply say thank you very much for taking the time to speak with us at Agribusiness Matters. Thank you very much for having me and giving me the opportunity to share our work. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, your 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 story and, and you know, when I was looking at your podcast and some of your earlier interviews, it was really uh, heartwarming in sense where you know there were a lot of parallels uh, because you know each of us uh, I, even I have sort of moved from different careers and to move into this uh, you know what really again fascinated me was you started your almost I mean you 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 said your ex boss was Paul Hawkin uh, <laughs> yeah. the famous uh, you know I don't know I don't know what to call him uh, you know probably he's one of the the visionaries of sustainability I would say in some sense who probably saw this, a lot of these challenges that we are grappling with right now in the early days. Uh, you know, in fact, in 2010, when uh, when I had a, a sort of my immersion into the world of ecology there, the first book I picked up was, as I was telling you before, it was Ecology of Commerce. So maybe, I mean, why don't we start with what is your first, uh, you know, interactions with Paul like, and maybe also your background and journey as to how did this, this transition really happen? You know, I will actually... Uh, like with most of us in India, uh, you know, who are coming from middle class backgrounds, my first exposure to both environmentalism and, uh, you know, care for the environment happened through the lens of my own upbringing in a small town in India. I am from Udaipur, Rajasthan, which is a mineral rich area where there is places like Hindustan Zinc, etc. You know, you can see the impact on the land from the mining marble industry. Uh, so you get to become very early on aware of what it's like to live in uh, ecosystems that are changing and you begin to question why they are changing and what's causing that and what correlation it has to the maybe the livelihoods of people, health of people, etc. And luckily I was, my mother is a fervent environmentalist and for me she's my guru and uh, the greatest like environmental activist that I've ever met because her actions and her um, uh, what she preaches are very very aligned uh, so uh, you know she made us question many many things about the way we consume the way we live throughout our lives not as a judgment but just kind of a gentle reminder by her own behavior so you know within that middle class upbringing where we were taught to just use the resources to the max make sure you don't waste all of us all of us in India know this uh, um, uh, this ethic so that aesthetic that ethic that just stayed with me throughout my life and really at one time this prompted me to make that switch because really it was I looked at my own mother I looked at her life as somebody who's worked on environmental issues including solar um, you know cookers back in the 80s uh, you know all of that stuff and thought okay you know she was only make, able to make an incremental difference while being a principal of a college of social work and training so many people, then what could I do to take some of that forward? And didn't I have an ethical responsibility to the very land that I truly love, uh, this land in which we are? So um, that's what kind of caused me to make that transition. Hopefully Great. What is the name? I would love to hear more. Uh, what my, is mother's name is, my mother's name is Raj Bhanti. She had been a professor, a lifelong professor, and then she became the principal of the Udaipur School of Social Work, which then was, which at that time was the institution that created a lot of the people that are now heading a lot of these institutions like Seva Mandir, Asta, you know, a lot of these kind of NGOs. So my mother used to ride a bicycle for 14 kilometers to her uh, college when she was the principal. So, you know, she really lived her life by example, has lived. She is continuing to this day, uh, very much inspiring all of us. She's just finished her ninth book as well. So anyway, so my mother, yes, has been a very strong uh, influence on me and my decisions. Beautiful. I mean, uh, you know, so the question of always the question of inspiration comes into really the, you know, the thing, right? Because oftentimes 
we are faced with a barrage of uh, you know in information that that doesn't really seem to give us a sense that humans have a control what is facing us right so uh, i i have always wondered you know i mean i I've, i've realized i've gone through the cycles in my own days where in terms of gone through the you know a, a, a period where you feel naive optimism and to a period where you feel complete hopelessness and to a certain level of a, a feeling of you feeling that no you know let me do whatever best i can do at the end of the day i'm i'm too small uh, for to to create a larger change there so i mean how how does been do you do you sort of go through this this whole curve there how how does it go for you you know the thing is that i'll bring it right down to the kind of work we do here because that really speaks to this train of thought that one has you know so i've always felt that um harnessing the wide spectrum of knowledge that we create along our career paths and concentrating that on the problems at hand whether they are land degradation or the soil emergency or behavior change towards you know emissions reduction whatever they might be so we need to figure out a way for us to apply whatever skills they are because that's the only hopeful thing we can do all of us we were talking right before this started that we go through this pendulum of hope and despair and uh, we you know i think the eastern philosophy already offers us enough philosophical understanding of what that actually means so putting aside all that maya and seeing you know whether that individual action and individual skill set can be applied to a very specific task and see if i can do my karma right my own action and whether it has an impact so we're very much i'm very much driven by that philosophy and so are you know many of uh, luckily many of my colleagues here at vetever so uh, really just figuring out you know that whole systems map like how do different skill sets intersect how do different issues play out within systems that we operate in how do these skill sets you know can they you know that whole donella meadows i'm sure you read that essay of the 12 points of intervening in a system what are these nodes how do we identify them what how does our skill set converge into this so what what i mean i'll kind of take this as an opportunity to go into what vetever is you know because sure please coming from and so at vetever what we've tried to do very very consciously is to bring together as many multidisciplinary people together into a single platform as possible so for instance right now we have you know a doctorate in horticulture uh, we have an agronomist we have uh, uh, two or three bachelors of science you know people who who really studied this then we have theater artists writers filmmakers designers illustrators behavior change experts you know a lot of just multidisciplinary thinkers because i've dabbled in the design world i have worked in the you know the visual communication space in the strategy space in the clean tech space and all of these things are super interconnecting right and in the age of generative ai we can def- definitely say that we are the need to bring it all together yeah we're creating a nice grinder here exactly so we've tried to consciously create a platform that looks at issues in the most tactile way possible literally like going beyond the esoteric like opining of what might happen and i'm chairing of all of that to really just saying brass tacks what is the issue can we become partners to this can we solve it at the not solve it at the last mile because we are primarily behavior change communications you know experts so i won't say that we are actually working to you know develop and innovate solutions that would make something affordable for farmers but we are certainly looking at solutions and then seeing how we can help the people who are creating the solutions really make sense to the farmer or make sense to a stakeholder because we work across agriculture forestry waste across various different streams so within the farmer and forestry space this is what we do yeah i mean i i i was looking at your illustrious uh, journey in terms of from working with the haryana agriculture council to to working on a variety of problems right maybe i, I would love to delve deeper on when you saying make a problem as tactile as possible uh maybe could you give us a give us a very specific example there right i mean and 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 get a sense of you see whenever uh, like you said right i mean the moment you said solve you you took a back step and said uh, we don't really solve but we made up sort of make people get a sense right typically what happens is you know i mean because i also work from the areas of these kind of systems aspect there there is always a question of uh you know like i give an advice to a person but the consequences of that advice is not borne by me you know what i mean so yes. how do you how do you, in this in that kind of a context how do you make sure that uh, you know you you sort of keep a problem at a very tactile level 
that's a wonderful way of saying it, you know, because uh, the fact that you don't face the consequences, you know, as consultants in the space, that is a very big ethical sort of responsibility we carry. So I think when I say tactile, um, what it really means is you go into the context in which you are trying to make a solution happen. You know, it could be something as simple as getting farmers to adopt mulching as a water saving and soil saving and organic matters, you know, yield increasing sort of an input uh, 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 method. And then you realize through several observations, discussions, engagements that the way the conversation is happening, for example, adopt mulching because mulching is really good for your soil. Let's say that is the statement that is being made. There is still a lot of tactiling one has to do to, to, to you know, uh, fill that gap between the farmer, between the field persons or the extension worker statement and the farmer's understanding because there are so many ways so many ways in which it may or may not happen. Is there enough biomass? Is there, do they need a certain technology? Do, what is their soil like? Have they tested it? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So what we try and do is just really understand it, try to understand barriers that might exist in just simple comprehension. You know, are we saying something that the farmer understands? Does the farmer even understand, forget about the why, because we all know the why, right? And sometimes we try to say, oh, climate change is happening, you need to do something, right? And farmer is like, I don't care about climate change, I just care about my yield, right? So from having to negotiate the way a field person might use an incentive or, an, or a compelling argument for the farmer to understand, to, um, to really making it visually and vernacularly, um, relevant for that farmer like oh i am going to understand mulching if you allow for me an understanding of the importance of let's say tree leaves or putting crop residue back by creating either a visually aided conversation which shows really um relatable imagery and puts the cost benefit in a way that feels very relatable because maybe you have reflected of neighboring farmer story to that person, or you have engaged an interpersonal conversation to generate social capital at the village level so that now there is a conversation that is happening that was never happening before, or you have deconstructed the process of uh, you know mulching for the farmer through your visual aids. So what we say tactile is we we create, you know, we create games and communications products and facilitate these dialogues as well. For the to literally cut through the barrier that we perceive, there is a barrier of understanding, and now we're going to do everything it takes to at least remove that and then get to the next stage. Because sometimes the conversation just gets stuck at that forever. People do their tasks, they go in, they speak at them, they they hand over a bunch of flyers, and they've gone right. And the farmer is now left to make this decision. They don't know. So this idea of understanding building something that they can understand through the visual communications medium that is vernacular, that is really like they understand, they see themselves in that message as well. And then coming back to reinforce it, understanding it. So that whole iterative process that you build. So this is what I mean by tactile, really. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm just, I, I really like what you, what he said in terms of where they, you get down to what is exactly stopping them from doing, right? And many times, at least, you know, when whatever little I've explored in this kind, in this space, you know, working with farmers and working in their spaces, that many of these decisions are also oftentimes, like in, I mean, agriculture is only the domain where your personal and professional merge very seamless, right? At least, you know, urban urbanites can, can have that kind of a distinction, like this is my professional life and this is my personal life. Whereas farmers don't have that luxury or or whatever, I mean, or you could say it is, it is it's probably in a, you know, I mean, you could be see it in different ways, but the fact is that these are lifestyle changes also, right? So, in in which case, maybe I'm I'm curious, you know, what what kind of ways in which the conversation starts to go slightly more inward and 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 starts to see in terms of what they have there. Would you have some specific examples of how maybe some of these questions made them introspect on their own lifestyles and what they're doing? My, uh, just to understand your question, you're saying how does one, um, what kind of tools do we create that make them introspect? Or, yeah. for example, I'll give you an example. Uh, for a project we are working on uh, in Punjab, 
Uh, it's called the Prana Project. Uh, it's by the Nature Conservancy. We developed um, we developed uh, a series of Gurdwara announcements, right? Uh, talk about introspection, right? We went straight to the Guru Granth Sahib uh, and we studied it and combed through it to understand so many beautiful environmental messages and lifestyles that are called for by the Guru Granth Sahib. And of course, you know, I think it's one of the most beautiful scriptures, you know, to could, to refer to, to see how much Guru Nanak Dev uh, was, was, you know, asking people to return to Kheti, to the agriculture as the as a thing to really understand life. Like all the metaphors for life were right in Kheti, right? And all the great saints have said the same thing. So using that, um, that beautiful institution that exists to see whether we can embed messaging within that ecosystem so that it subliminally asks farmers to introspect to see you know whether the sayings because they do visit the gurdwaras to see whether these connect with their own behavior so we're not there to observe we're not there to goad them or anything we're just trying to embed them within the ecosystem in which they operate yeah and i think i think yeah they tackling into religion and culture in that way is a extremely powerful because it, yeah i think it it will help, help 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 them probably introspect deeper there yeah i mean the reason why i was also asking the question of introspection is many times you know uh, like i mean as as i can i can do a bit of a self deprecatory from an agri tech perspective right we all try to bring technologies and we try to tell them i mean that's the one reason where i was very eager to have this conversation also right because we typically we tend to think that we have a superior technology, we have a superior way in which you can do things. But then you know it 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 meets a wall of resistance because you know because the, you get a sense that you you don't understand my context, right? And if you were probably in my shoes, you would probably do the same thing, right? And mm -hmm. and and I think that's where you know there's this whole question of you know and probably somewhere you know many times when we are also looking at some of these questions like I mean some of these questions have been like even in the case of crop residue and burn we've been asking these questions for a year and year and year out there's a certain sense of theatricality now it has come in, in terms of how much time it gets repeated in these things and and so that's where you know there's always a question of at what stage when the penny drops. And when it becomes like, you know, where, yeah, this is something that maybe I need to worth, worth worthwhile to look at rather than simply saying, you know, you really, really know about what, what I'm going through, you know? Uh, yeah, I look, the thing is that there may be, there may be that one moment, like our teams will go to Kisan Melas and they will have these conversations with farmers. And there are times in which they suddenly add many things together and suddenly it's like, aha, I could be doing that, which is usually a combination of, understanding other farmers' experiences, having a clear-cut reference and evidence of cost-benefit. You know, what is my cost? What is my benefit? Having a clear understanding of how easy it is to access something, you know. But again, these are very done at a very human scale and the question of scale becomes an issue because one-on-one -on -one conversations can very much lead to, the, to that moment in which people can say, oh yeah, this makes sense for me. But, uh, you know, leaving them with a set of information and walking away and hoping that that will trigger that response usually becomes uh, difficult. However, we all know that presenting to them evidence through the stories of other farmers is always a wonderful and important way. And making that effort to seeing whether there is a, a farmer that is similar in nature to them who has, uh, who will be, who has a similar uh, journey and bringing that farmer story to them saying, look at this, this person has done this, this is what they've benefited and we've you know, been meeting with them and this is what, they, what it is and we can enable a conversation. Those kind of things will become, you know, wherever you add that social capital component is where something becomes a little bit more tractable. Yeah, and I, I think I think I've, I've heard it, I've heard you say also social component and, and social capital also, you know, as a, uh, as, as I think a commonality probably, I guess, in terms of many of these projects that you do, they were. Intent, intake right undertake where there is a, a certain sense of uh you realizing that for the change to happen a certain kind of social uh capital has to be raised among the people for them through interactions and then that change happens right is that a common thread you've always seen i i do feel you know one of the things that kind of depresses me honestly uh when i you know obviously lived abroad for a little while came back to india and i saw that the cohesion the social cohesion that we used to have in our communities even in our urban communities and rural communities is fast eroding and that has probably great metaphors for how fast the land is eroding and all that but um, I think uh, 
really working to bring back trust with each other, understanding whether a person from within the community can be a source of you know, information, uh, reinforcement, all of these things are very important subliminal things one has to do while you're working directly on the more overt messaging and overt aims to target behavior. And I feel that that is a, almost a moral imperative that everybody in the development sector should have, even not non-development like agri-tech and all of that stuff. Like, don't just try to sell the app or the tech or whatever, try to figure out what, how they relate to each other and who they are influenced by within, an, within a social system so that you can broaden that for them. So then you can help maybe, you know, bring them out of that little, I got a benefit, I got to do this and, uh, you know, figure out how to actually build that cohesion. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I, I think to a certain extent, you know, one of the reasons where urban, urban India, at least people and people like urbanites who when you go there, we see that there is already a certain sense of cohesion that is there. So, so that itself itself feels like there is something that, you know, we definitely can take over for people who live atomized lives in, in cities, right? Uh, and, and but the question comes in, I mean, I was just recently reminded of this incident, uh, you know, it's happened in Odisha and I, I keep, recently, it, it really shook my ground in many ways, uh, you know, where this a group of uh, young women from, you know, uh, young men and women from rural Odisha, uh, had come come together for a sort of a gathering and we were asking them questions about you know what are your uh, what are your assets what do you have you know what is there in your neighborhood in your village and and we were asking these questions and then uh, when we asked them how many of you consider yourselves poor you know then the, the entire hands all went up right uh, because that that really sort of shook me in the sense that you know if they have a certain sense of cohesion in terms of what assets they have in terms of what they have but there is always a certain sense of, uh, you know, like probably, you know, in, in the development sector, all there also is some, and some part of us as is also to be blamed where we kind of sort of label them as something one who needs, you know, uh, that they need solutions that we have. You know, you get what I mean? That kind of a dynamics there. So how do you, I mean, I'm, I'm curious in given your wealth of experience, uh, there is there has always been an effort where probably you might probably break that kind of dynamic also, right, in your engagements. Uh, do you sort of do that and how do you do it? How do you tackle that? Yeah, I mean, that's that's something that uh, will look. Usually we work to support programs that are already working, you know, with a very complex uh, set of partners and stuff on the ground. But uh, so what we try and do is to never go in uh, with the hat that we know anything more than the farmers do. That's like just a simple assumption that we make that we, we go in to just learn and learn and learn. I genuinely consider farmers the gurus of, you know, uh, of all of us. They understand more, they feel more, they know, more, they, they are connected to land more, all of that. So um, I think, uh, I mean, this is a, I don't necessarily, I haven't been able to create a, you know, yet a system that I can verifiably say to you works. But every time we've gone into communities, there's four or five states that we've gone in, you know, uh, deeply in. Uh, we will just go in and and have conversations with farmers uh, based on a very um, you know understanding just just a bunch of questions like I'll give you an example of a UP farmer um, I went in uh, we said we sat and we had like you know of course you have chai and all of that stuff with them and I saw a bunch of trees around his uh, farm and this was basically he was already an agroforestry champion so I said how many trees do you have here and he said you know, I don't measure just the way I don't measure what I feed my sons, which son I feed more. I don't measure at all. And, uh, you know, whenever you measure something, you diminish its importance. And I just, uh, I just know that I have many trees, right? And through a drone shot and everything that we took, we realized that there, he had at least different 56 different species of trees on a very small farm. It was phenomenal. So when you have something that humbling and that deep in front of you, you really have to just consider them the knowledge bearers and just say, I'm here to learn from you. Is it possible for me to take your story to try to amplify it for others? Because what you're doing is tremendous. What is it that I can do to support, you know, that kind of thing. So our teams are also trained to do that. So we really, this is a one-on-one -on -one kind of a thing, a conversation on the ground to just learn from the farmers. That's all I can say. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, I think, yeah. This, this sense. I mean, I think to a large extent is getting widespread, and I'm among people who are looking at the space there. I mean, talking of amplifying the voice, there, right? I mean, I also when I looked at your portfolio of work, and I what was fascinating was you have a very wide varieties of means in which you approach. Right? There is a look at play in some context. There is also a, a and 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 I see that you made movies in the past. Uh, so I, I'm also curious, you know, typically just to get a slightly deeper on your process of how you sort of look at amplifying the voice, right? Like you said, this is a, in this case, how do you select the mediums and there? So you sort of got to go with creatively there, or you've sort of come up with a certain kind of system of, you know, this is the kind of thing I will, I will probably go for this kind of an approach there. Um, definitely it's very context specific. You have to map things that they go to what we call their touch points right you you try to map all the places in which they congregate which they pray in which they celebrate uh you know places places and people that influence them and then you begin to create a map of the of the you know dissemination channels that you can use to try to go to them so uh, it is very, very context uh, driven. And uh, one one mistake, a lot of, not just a mistake, I think it is a lot of to do to, with the lack of funding. Like people do a very broad stroke approach. You know, we'll do five Nukarnataks and we'll do a few flyers and we will create a few posters and uh, that will be great, you know. And so it looks great on camera and there are great, you know, samples of the things you've done, but really they haven't been able to influence people. So, you know, in our case, I'll give you an example in, in um, Gujarat, in a remote area in a tribal area we worked uh, to develop scripts let's say on soil health then we worked with people who spoke basava which is a you know a dialect there uh, took our theater artists to work with that community to train them on those narratives to understand what how they entertain how they engage their communities then train them to see how they can take our narratives and embed them and to kind of like then observe how they presented it and observe how the audience reacted to it then come back to say hey here's how we need to iterate so one of the things about this whole process is that it's never a top down obviously and it's never a one time shot it's literally the most iterative process ever even when it's uh, something so specialized as just the communication side because you're trying to figure out what engages people so we we look at like a whole spectrum of things and and figure out what might be most context appropriate yeah so maybe we could delve a little bit more there when you're saying iterative and and kind of you sort of there like typically you know i mean one of the challenges i've always faced uh, working from a development context is each of these tend to have a project kind of a timeline, you know, and and so the the one of the challenges is always is that everything is start off in a project and with a report to end uh, to show that this is what we've done and this is there and after that what happens, you know, that's always a question that happens. So I'm, I'm curious, given your wealth of experience, I'm sure you would have been also been frustrated by that and probably find would have found ways to circumvent it. I'm curious how you have sort of figured a way to to make this go beyond whatever, you know, quote unquote of the frame of a project with a fancy report. Yeah, absolutely. And you, you must have seen recently, we were at Manage down in Hyderabad. The four of us went down uh, in our team and, uh, you know, interacted with about 70 people to show them the tools, to walk them through our processes and to see if they would like to just do it. In this case, we were very lucky that, you know, uh, the partner funder we were working with were just ready for people to, you know, take these resources the KVK, at the KVK level and begin to use them. So we very much insist on figuring out how something that we develop has a beyond the project uh, life and we build. So right now we are building a knowledge resource on natural farming in India and we are trying to figure out how what are the tools that are not available in other platforms, you know, that exist and seeing how it is that our own work from different projects can be nestled in there. Of course, with an agreement from the, you know, from the client that they are okay with this, with this kind of an approach. So we are very much um, focused on this and we are focused on figuring out how to even write our own recommendations. So we engage, you know, like I'm engaging with you right now, we'll engage, we'll write a blog, you know, it's how we recently conducted a fantastic um, I would say a very seminal kind of a workshop, uh, mm -hmm. the proceedings for which we are just putting together. We had everybody from the Ministry of Agriculture to manage. To, it was in, done in partnership with Manage and Crisp. Uh, so tons of the key stakeholders in the agri ecosystems to come in to say, what is the role of behavior change communications? And we have some great learnings from there, which we will be putting on our website soon as well. So a lot of this 
knowledge churning, knowledge management, exploring and figuring out is what we are always trying to do and extending the life of the knowledge that we have developed so that it can be of use to everybody else. So we're always looking for ways to do that. Especially nice. at policy level, because we're in Delhi and we have relationships with the, you know, in the Ministry of Environment, we are embedded in one of the cells there supporting behavior change for um, for uh, on mission life, you know, and then we have a relationship with the Ministry of Agriculture also. So we get to then dabble in some policy linkages as well. Yeah, you were telling me recently that in terms of the Ministry of Agriculture, you're right now looking at also taking this work forward also. Yes, basically. very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe, I mean, I would love to de delve into this part there, right? Because you this word behavioral change intervention is always, is a, uh, you know, I mean, when I look at it purely from a, from a psychology perspective, there's always a various theories and approaches in terms of when the behavioral change happens, right? And, and you don't mention the word that vernacular. Mm -hmm. Right? Because typically, the, one of the challenges that, that comes in is that at least among the policy circles, there is a strong need to, to sort of adapt uh, some of these changes into a global one with, you know, look at scientific modes or ways of reporting it and also stand, apply certain global standards. Here. But at the same time, you know, we when we are looking at it from the grassroots level there, we need to make it vernacular there. So I, I'm curious, do you sort of bridge your balance there? How do you, you know, when you're saying vernacularizing a certain behavioral change approach, do you have you sort of come up with a theory of what does a behavioral change look like in an Indian na Indic native context? I don't know, whatever term you want to call that, but yeah. I We have written, I mean, I've written one piece about it for ASA, uh, for Chris, uh, something about how the theories and, uh, you know, we looked at different theories sociological theories, which are usually considered the, you know, the uh, bedrock for behavior change approaches. And um, we realized that exactly where they miss out is the, you know, the vernacular part and also um, incentives, you know, how people behave, whether they are influenced by each other or whether they are magnanimous and they might do something for just because they want to help somebody. These things are still being worked out. You know, I think people still are trying to understand whether, for example, I'll give you an example. When I go to Punjab and I work with Punjab farmers and I work with Punjab teams, there's a certain kind of a cohesion and, and warmth and, you know, sort of a joy in the work that you may not see in other places. There's just a joy, even when there are things that are not that positive you you sense a sense of joy right and you might go to another state where there things are a little bit more somber and they're much more interested in the solutions they're a very value-centric approach right so everywhere that you go that you have to modify your narrative you have to modify your not just modify create recreate rather uh your ways of approaching what your visuals look like what your message looks like what it sounds like what your you know performance artists are what kind of cultural uh, influences exist so it really is I mean in our work I say this all the time we are all about replicability but not about scale like we can't scale there is not there's not no such thing as scale you have to keep on going to every single place and redoing it I don't think that look the theories are fantastic and they are definitely provide a really great way of thinking about once what incentivizes change and how do you measure uh, the change but again the tools for cause for making that happen I think we are still in that exploratory discovery phase. I, I'm not sure that we are there yet in terms of, you know, what really influences farmers. It's, of course, everybody agrees that it's costs and benefits. Ultimately, that's what it is. But then there's a whole outside layer of things that we have to, we have to work on. And that's where vernacular really plays an important role. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the reason why I was asking this also question was also was from the place that, like, I mean, recently in uh, last November, I was part of a seminar for, uh, which focused on the, you know, various scholars who have looked at the managing sustainability transitions. And one of the conversations we were having is, like, you know, today, uh, if you ask a farmer, Javik car is, is a certain way of saying how they look at organic. Or some people call it a Javik car, some people call it as organic. And now the West, West has created a narrative called it's regenerative. And now if you look really look at what is happening in the academic circles, uh, ICR has published a report saying uh, has, has gone against ZDNF. So there's these entire, you know, sort of, uh, I mean, at, at one of the, you could say at a philosophical, they're all one and the same in terms of an approach there. But but for a farmer, when it gets translated in terms of what the farmer is, is as a taking home for him to implement, there's a barrage of uh, you know noise of various approaches there. So I'm, I'm wondering, you know, given your experience, do you see a way to clear through this clutter and and help them focus on what really is important? Um, 
so you know you might work on uh, what intervention is needed to improve soil and ecosystems at a context level right mm -hmm. that's where you begin and you don't you you delink yourself from you know whether it's conservation agriculture zbnf organic or any of that and you just say what i would like to do is get this farmer to add more soil organic matter and the way i want them to do this is to put back crop residue and potentially grow a series of trees around there so that they have the benefit of this right so you focus it very specifically on the intervention and delink it from everything else you know so then the khad comes in the mulching comes in the low chemical inputs comes in or the no chemical inputs comes in so all of these behaviors again um, understanding what is the big issue at an ecosystem level and, and thankfully you know there are enough scientists who understand uh, at that level what needs to be done for example if the water levels are you know really poor and very low in a particular area and you're trying for them to also adopt drip irrigation but at the same time they can't afford drip irrigation and you were trying for them to stop the flood irrigation all of that stuff then you have to figure out you know whether there are you know ways to transition them to our DSR instead of you know a particular yeah. flood irrigation paddy. So so these are again understanding just the nature of I hear the understanding of the different parameters that drive resilience, climate resilience, as well as improve natural ecosystems really matters. So you know if the field teams and one of the big things that we do at Vetiver is build the capacity of field teams to understand the differences. What is ZBNF? What is conservation? What is natural? What is this? And don't worry about any of these. What really is, is the soil is your hero. Figure out like how to improve the soil. And it doesn't matter whether it's organic or natural or anything, because ultimately we want this thing to, you know, to be these circular systems that are operating in and of themselves. So really, I, I do agree that the ecosystem of um, competing, or not just competing, but different uh, words and uh, uh, practices that are assigned to different things because people are trying to uh, put less pressure on farmers who cannot afford to go fully organic and being able to do at least something along the way and keep adding to those practices. Uh, I think it's good enough that you just go to the intervention level and just figure out how to draw a boundary around, around that work and just speak directly to that particular effort without referencing any of these uh, memes or whatever we're going to call them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, at the end of the day, we stick to basics there. And and, and maybe, I mean, I also, you know, also sort of an extension to this is that, uh, you know, would, would, how is your experience? Have you sort of done this, taken this work outside India as well? Uh, you know, I, I, you know I, I'm also bringing this question because we have a lot of members from Europe, right? Will is here, who is, he's from, originally from Ireland. Uh, so we have, uh, you know, the farmers face the same issues here, uh, you know, whether whether they are in Europe protesting again or in, in, in Punjab protesting against, uh, you know, the government. Uh, so I'm curious, have you looked at uh, cross-cultural aspects of how some of the training and the tools set could be applied in different contexts there? We are very, very eager to explore that. We have heard that uh, one of our partners has been, uh, they has taken this tool to Kenya. And we've also heard that this tool has been showcased at Dubai at one of the you know environmental meetings. But we are very, very eager for uh, our work to be used by as many people as possible, really, you know, because we 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 are at a place where there's no time left, right? There's no time left for the urgency of climate action and land restoration. So whatever tools can be useful from us to amplify further, we would be very eager to seek those, you know, partnerships and support that work. Great. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think we've been speaking for a while now. In case Will and Vivek want to want to chime into the conversation, uh, most welcome to jump in. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, go, go, yeah. You go, Vivek. I'll go after. Oh no, no, that's fine. You, you, you can go first. Okay. Thanks. Uh, well, thank you so much for first sharing your knowledge. This is amazing. Um, and uh, yeah, so I. I currently work in ag tech but I actually used to work in the game industry so it's interesting to see the uh, the cross uh, correlation here um i think we could probably learn a lot from the approaches i was uh, wondering so you mentioned you were building a knowledge source for natural farming um but then we also had the issue of like not being able to scale very well because you need to be so um because it's so diverse you have to um approach in very different ways which i completely agree with how so then how do you present the knowledge base such that uh you know it could theoretically scale um 
in a, in a useful way. Yeah, to that end, I think we've tried to do what uh, we are creating. We have created a partnership with Manage, which is the authoritative institution in India that's really building the capacity of all agri-extension workers across India to scale up natural farming. So our tools are already within their ecosystem. So within India, we have been able to do that. But I, I think internationally, we're just going to have to look at you know, what those partnerships look like. So you're saying based on the partnerships, you're looking at more of scaling uh, because you'll have different players collaborating, coming in and then taking the work further. Is that how you're looking at it? Um, yeah, we look, we think that there are, we think that this is just the beginning, right? We have about 17 different tools right now. And we are always still in the process of trying to understand what's working, what's not, and how we can improve things better so that you know farmers understand. And we are also trying to understand the interventions much more because each intervention even has its own set of practices and they, those two change by context, right? So until like, it's almost like a very large part of our work right now is just understanding what those knowledge areas are what the diversity in each one of these interventions is, and then how do we communicate these further for the larger scale? So, you know, we would love, uh, in fact, we are currently in the process of making a game for the Ministry of Environment on, uh, on a, something separate, but also related to the environment. Uh, it's a web-based game that gives people uh, rewards for, you know, giving the correct answer and moving to the next stage. And that is a very scalable thing. Like you could easily take that and just, make it available to the international community. So we would be really interested in seeing if there is a digital component of this that could be scaled up to reach farmers who do have access to smartphones and whether this could be in multiple languages around the world, you know. Uh, so, but right now, I will be perfectly honest, our deep focus is India and we are just, uh, it's not as if we won't, we would love to make these tools available, but we really want to take this tool to every corner of India right now to reduce the climate risks that our farmers are facing immediately yeah yeah no i i, I think i totally understand i mean I, I mean that's where it brings up to another point that you know typically whenever the conversations i've had with farmers on are on these kind of topics is the first question is there is yield loss how am i going to bear with that you know uh because yield loss is going to happen the moment you do a transition there so when i'm doing a transition and and when i'm sort of even even i'm, I'm well equipped there there is a whole lot of yield loss that you're going to face in at least in the initial few years there. So, uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you would have heard that question also far too many times. Yeah, we need to, we need to understand. And that's where really smart climate, uh, climate, uh, finance systems come in, right? We work. So Vetiver, uh, Vetiver's partner is Iora Ecological. I think, uh, you've, you might've seen. So yeah. I'm also co-founder of Iora Ecological where we do a much larger scale project implementation work. And that's where a lot of the, you know, climate finance and figuring out blended finance mechanisms, et cetera, and how these things actually work at a and you, you said you've already working on such systems as well. So we, we try to look at it from that angle as well to see, you know, how can investments in such things work to scale up solutions for farmers. But we are tinkering in the visual and uh, behavior change space right now. To okay, develop. okay. Yeah, because I mean, it's blended finance has been with their talks for a long. I mean, I've, I've been hearing it about it for a way quite, quite some time in terms of looking at uh, various pools of risk there. But I haven't seen uh, sort of a very good case study that I can point out and say this is a good resource to tell how exactly a blended finance will work, uh, you know, in, in terms of helping farmers to, let's say, to transition to that. So, so that's where I was eager. Maybe you have some more ground examples of how things have shifted there. I guess the only things uh, we are seeing is, you know, large chunks of money embedded within climate resilience planning under MG Narega, for instance, or, you know, and that money being facilitated by a series of zero compounded financial mm -hmm. inflows. Um, we have seen some examples. I mean, I guess you could see examples of some subsidies or some ways of, uh, you know, incentivizing a farmer. Uh, to rent certain machinery, custom hiring centers. So there are examples, bits and pieces of these there that are being definitely propelled by larger finance, um, financial restructuring, I suppose, for the way the funds flow. But I think we're going to see a lot more of that in terms of risk insurance. You know, uh, climate insurance is one that's also coming up. So I don't know exactly how, which part of agri-tech you guys are working in and what you are trying to solve, but I'm not a finance expert, so I can't speak any more to this 
no no i i think i think yeah all kinds of pieces are part of the puzzle there so i think uh, insurance has a play there are all kinds of people who are right out trying out different various modes there uh insuring farmers in with 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 certain technologies there for rain insurance and for crop insurance there yeah. uh yeah but but the the overall the transition financing is where it's still a, a bit of a gray area at this point yeah yeah vivek your question please sorry uh, no uh, thank you uh, i was a very illuminating conversation i would say multidisciplinary uh in every possible sense so uh i am everything uh, that you wish uh, you 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 don't approach like we did the behavioral science without knowing we were doing some sort of behavioral change we tried to do all of these things so a little bit of experiment experiential knowledge in this space so a couple of things i wanted to ask you know double click on uh, some of the things you mentioned so uh, when you say that things are not scalable uh, when you are doing behavioral science like uh, could you could you point out to what aspect of it is so difficult for uh, enabling frontline workforce to implement some of your tools right uh, yeah we'll start with that we will we'll have this conversation i think this no correlating honestly correlating the ecological context to the socio cultural context that's it right those two things uh, when the, those connecting those two every single time and within one state we have so many languages you know figuring out languages figuring out ways you know influencers figuring out every single thing that makes uh, an a, a system of people behave a certain way and then and then building tools that will compel them and that is exactly what we are trying to do like i i was in advertising i was in brand strategy we used to look at massive amount of psychographic data we used to analyze how a person might buy a pair of luxury shoes at a certain touch point and what message could we give them that would actually drive them to make that change right that's the background but i've realized you know when i started working in the indian villages and everything it, things change from village to village and the way people behave a certain way changes and we have to really really respect that we have to respect those customs those social norms those socio cultural uh, aspects and figure out how to speak to just this group of people we have to make it seem as if this is the only farmer whose behavior i'm changing and the problem is we are we are all playing the large numbers game right we all want like scales so that there is money and there is venture capital and blah, blah, blah. but what if you didn't want that what if you just just really just wanted to change really help a certain set of farmers in a certain small place to just accept this and that was all you wanted to do that's when it you know because that is the only way that i can see it working right now Right. Uh, I agree. Not denying it. Uh, I, uh, it's it's a it's a hard thing uh, to do at scale or envision at scale because there's not no commonality that is connecting them except the word agriculture. Uh, no commodity is the same. So I I completely uh, empathize with the statement that you made, which is accurate. So uh, on the aspect of you building games, right? Uh, so there's a field of science called cognitive. uh cognitive sciences which kind of basically uh helps executive strain through scenario planning play games uh get them make better decisions so this is linking two things that you mentioned right to which where enki alluded to is decision making so farmer is fundamentally making a lot of decision and get set on a sunk cost which is the season and then faces the brunt of whatever it is it it, it either becomes a positive if he bets against the market or it becomes a i would say fail safe if he bets for the bets with the market so in and it's a calamity if the climate changes so uh bhagwan ke naam pe ya market ke naam pe ya mai mai i am the influencer like i am the one who pushes the norm in farming i i am pr- i am proud of what i do so what sort of decisions do you think sh- should they train to because uh in all of this uh, what i send to get is that they don't make good decisions because they leave it till the last wee bit for someone else to make the decision for them uh, they can be financially cash strapped they are they are out of time labor shortages uh, these are the common patterns that we see right large scale issues uh, if they want to invest one of the things is uh, transition finance right that's not available so government subsidy comes over here which is like the like the gtm for all our ag techs if i align my selling to a government subsidy i'm golden for at least that season 
So like, so my two parter is what sort of decisions do you think they need training and things that we could change? The second one would be, you know, you you at the end of your your big I guess biggest person who funds your projects is government at the end of the day, which is a policy. So the government views them as a stakeholder. They would like agriculture to develop, but first they would like to protect the farmer. And ecological farming is all about between a farmer and the ecosystem, right? Sometimes you need to make trade offs. So how do you how do you navigate that space? And like these are interconnected, but these are some of the things that's been bothering me. I'm not able to pinpoint as to how do I address it or make sense I of it. For we could all, I wish we could all together <laughs> crack this crack this conundrum because it's not. I mean, it's I I'm too new. I mean, I, I can't even. I'm not even an expert at all. I've just worked for a few years with farmers, so I have some understanding. But uh, uh, I think a simple thing is that farmers, many farmers that I've met, smallholder farmers, don't keep track of their expenses or their, you know, uh, their um, income even. Income may be more, but expenses not at all. So they are really clueless about what their actual budgetary thing looks like. So, I mean, just that in itself could potentially make them help them make better decisions if they could be taught to you know see that that is an important thing that's one i would say okay understood uh, <clears throat> understood so the second part that like let me try to rephrase is that today your biggest benefactor i would say the funder would be subsidy programs that are helping to change some sort of impact uh, and and there are when you said about the moralistic view then there are certain things that will that that you need to build. So, what sort of moral compass do you have for yourself and the team? And then, uh, how do you how how have you developed? That is one thing. Um, you know, you must have heard at the very beginning. Honestly, my own moral compass in my uh, lighthouse is my own mother and her value system. And constantly throughout my life to this day, every day, there is a reinforcement from her to say course correct in case you are assuming something wrong you know uh she so you're honestly i think about this a lot you know whether we need a really a major ethical cleansing and i guess when you look back at all the thousands of years i guess every reformation has been followed by some kind of a spiritual awakening which has been brought on by some kind of a saint of somewhere you know around the world right so you hope that people can plug back into the idea that farmers are are um, everything, right? It's the farmers, it's the it's what they grow that helps us sustain under very harsh conditions. And if you don't have compassion, deep empathy and uh, love for them as a stakeholder, love in your heart, genuine love in your heart, uh, that is our moral compass, love and gratitude and deep like, you know, wow, we put them on a massive pedestal and see what can we do? What can we do to help you? Not that what can I get from you? How can I make my balance sheets fatter? And how can I, you know, do these returns? And I mean, I, I'm sorry, but I can't stand the whole agri venture space in which people are trying to make gigantic amounts of money for by changing farmer behavior, because I feel that many, many such players are not driven by solving a problem. They are mostly looking at numbers and modeling these Excel things that in a you know, long range look like you can sell X amount of X and make a lot of money. The problem is that uh, I know I'm talking about radical stuff and that goes against the whole economic system in which we work. But I think when it comes to farmers, really just looking at it as a as a one-on-one -on -one thing and having armies of people like me and you guys there to say, let's just keep scaling this. Let's work with these farmers. That's the only thing that will honestly uh, bring the reassurance that they need that the path that they're on will work. Also, the assurance that somebody really cares about the about my well-being, you know, not just yeah. quick returns on me, which is where the fatigue has already set in from everybody and figuring out how, and seeing whether you can make them believe that they're that you have their best interests in mind. Like this is all a trust kind of back and forth, you know, negotiation. So you got to take your best moral foot forward and you hope that your entire team is speaking that same moral language that you are, I guess, whatever that morality thing means. 
This will be the last question, uh, so that uh, just so that those balance sheet Excel people are not making money; they're making revenue. So <laughs> you don't have to worry about the money part. They are burning money, literally uh, faster than the Punjab fires. So don't have to worry <laughs> about that. Uh, uh, but when it comes to uh, what you mentioned about uh, uh, the engagement with the farmer, so today farmer is the weakest link, but with the highest ownership on the outcome of whatever we sow and whatever we reap and working with farmer is not scalable. I think this entire conversation is one of the things that any agri tech person will take is that, that it's not scalable. It needs what you would say as a holistic, what you said is a social status uh, engagement. And one of the things that I've witnessed time and time again is the condescension with which I enter the field and tell them what to do. Uh, instead, they would like to be challenged and goaded into saying that I'm better than you to, so that they can prove me wrong, which has worked. It's confrontational with the men, uh, empowering with the women. That's been what worked for a lot of the success, a little bit of success, like I said, uh, in, in our case in the past. But here is uh, my... So when, when, when you're talking about uh, social status, right? So what are some of the tools that we should take away to ensure that we are not condescending farmers? Uh, how do you build the common common language, I would say, between those two? Like, uh, you could, we could talk about some of the like facilitation exercises that we do. Uh, this is very critical is because uh, I'll tell you from our standpoint, what we do is we hire someone from the community to kind of short change all of this, shortcut all of this, and ask them to make a change, right? This change is, is, is a one-time conversion, not a sustainable conversion. So we are burning through a lot of social capital of agri-tech. Actually, there's nothing tech in our agri. It's only digital part of it, most of it. So again, so every narrative, we try to make it too simplistic to the top. But what I'm trying to say is that you say it's complex, but some of the thing is that because you say it's complex, people don't start hearing it. So if you can like lay out a framework for us, or somewhere we could go, you know, to just just so that then we will do our agri tech thing, build the narratives. Look, I I uh, I mean I don't have that ready framework for you to just <laughs> plug into. I could just say that please just make them you know go through the the cycles of trust that a typical person has to go through. I mean when you want to get you know even when you borrow money from a friend it takes years of knowing them and you before you can ask them something like this right so like just knowing that it takes time to build trust for them to trust your process and you can't go in just because you it cost you you know x y z amount of money to drive into that remote village and now who are how are you going to do this again so might as well squeeze every conversation within one meeting like you got to just figure out how to not do that and also empower the person who's within the community you know, everybody does that, right? They go into community, they hire the person and they become the advocate for things. Then empower that person with genuine tools that that they have the answers to all the questions that the farmers have and also they are able to engage, which is where a lot of games come from. Like, make them have fun. Like let them really do something other than, you know, solve problems for you or jump on your bandwagon or not, you know? Just let them be, engage with them. Just simply have interactions and then slowly it'll get there suddenly so i don't have i don't have a framework for you this is all i'm saying from my own experience sounds good i think this has been one of my most fun conversations to be had. and <laughs> fyi i don't work in agri so that's why i'm able to say all of this so oh you don't work in agri what do you do <laughs> you're still... a favorite scientist no i i'm just the guy who 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 did an agri startup long time back so but I'm still very much engaged in this space. Thanks to Enki and his community. <laughs> no, let me also tell you what Vivek's unarticulated question was. Uh, see, there is always a tension between, uh, there is a certain social context we enter in, right? As outsiders. And, and of course, we know we also see certain dysfunctional elements of that social context. So the question then comes as to, to what extent do we, uh, you know, uh, you know, the question which probably Vivek is not really directly asking is to what extent do we sort of respect that social context and to what extent do we challenge that social context? Yeah, you got to... Yeah, 
the example is that uh, women farmers have been my biggest supporters right and, and and the only way i can reach them is through hiring more women and trust me uh, nothing is much harder than that at the field level uh, and uh, so these things are not obvious to the to the to the uninitiated or uh, but this is also i need to hire from the same community and that they don't have the same awareness that i'm looking at right so when i see an another uh, meeting where all men are sitting and then there is being a broadcast of this new product field trial nothing motivates me as much as sitting in their houses and talking about something like these sort of things and uh, that's what when i say i challenge them uh, you challenge the men to say that okay big deal what did you do i had to come to this field to work with you because you couldn't do anything with your life till now like make them question their manlyhood to kind of get them to engage with something work for us in certain context it would be a very different thing if i did the same thing in north i wouldn't be alive anymore but it worked in the south so <laughs> oh, we would again... love to talk to you a little bit more about what worked for you because i mean these this is what uh, you know venkat like you were helping us all map the best practices right so i mean you have these as your best practices and i the the reason we held even that uh, bcc workshop is to just bring people together to say what's working and what's not working in india you know we talk to people who are doing shadow puppetry radio programs all of that stuff we should all come together as a community and really go into the granularity of like what it means to challenge a you know farmers manner to drive behavior change or what it means to empower women to drive behavior change i think those answers are not there yet and we're all we're all putting that those data points together Yeah, yeah. No, I think I think we all of us are you know experimenting a few things there. Right now, one of the things I see really work is uh is sort of helping them discover their agents. I mean, in the like what uh, Goonj has been doing, right? And Anshu Anshu Gupta has been doing in terms of the yeah. Gram Sabiman, right? Because when you sort of give them the ownership, right? Because otherwise, otherwise we've been using them as sort of as the resources that we can use it for our benefits, right? And 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 here I like as you'd have figured out by now. This is a space where almost we 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 equally bash agri tech and we equally praise agri tech also. So nothing is sacred in this space. So in that given that said, you know that's where the question of uh you know what kind of ways will things will work and 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 yeah. But I also want to sort of reflect on the previous point which Vivek was also mentioning there. Right? One of the also biggest roadblocks in this is that. uh for a for a farmer whose life is a very much at a long term horizon at least from whatever elevator interactions i've had interacting with them they've seen is they're extremely short termist in some sense right in terms of they, i mean they don't have the luxury i mean i don't even blame them they don't have the luxury to think long term like a uh, people like us you know who are slightly more privileged than than them right so in that sense uh i think that's also a very big uh, behavioral change question that it's always there in terms of like unless and the, the only place where i've seen changes like i know a farmer in 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 erod uh he was he's been he grew up as a sprayer and then one day he he had a he fell sick and then he suddenly had this epiphany that you know i can't do this anymore and then he switched to became a natural farmer right so unless until it hits them in their own personal lives then they make that shift or otherwise uh you know it it otherwise then the the, the cycle and the the matrix in which they trapped is so short termist and so like you know like like what it's a ma, ma, market bharosi what we were saying so i think that shift is where the you know the real challenge is in terms of for them to kind of see that you know what i'm doing here like you say right kara bhara right? what i'm doing has an impact on me also in many ways so i think that's where the real challenge is also there yeah no i i think just to sorry shayad please go. no you... no please go ahead please go ahead no i was just saying that what you mentioned about them not knowing their accounts you know uh, them they not knowing their expenses i think it is they do it consciously so that they would never get to know the real picture mm-hmm. it, it's it's their plausible deniability because if they actually get to know them they have then they cannot even feel proud about anything in their life mm-hmm. uh and, and 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 that's that's a stark realization that i see when interacting with women they are very calculative they will ask every account they will keep the logbook that the men don't even though they don't know how to keep it because they have been uh, capacity built by the sg community 
So they know how to keep the ledgers. They do keep the ledgers. Someone else keeps them. It's not in their house. It will be in someone else's house. But they actually know how much money that the man lost. But the problem is they don't enter the mandi, so they never know at what price they take it. So they never get the feedback. Mm -hmm. These are all interesting things. But I would say uh, the additional point is that we've asked you all the things about what we are thinking, but what is it that you're looking to do with agri-tech? Like you said, you that you would like to communicate, you know, collaborate in these spaces, have more people have diverse background. Trust me, we are not that drivers as an agri-tech community in India. We are all the same. Vivek, I think I'll, I'll stop you a bit here. Before, I think let's 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 first uh, uh, hear her uh, yes. in terms and then yeah. we'll enter into the agri-tech collaboration part later. Maybe yeah, the yeah. question is in terms of you know, at, at this kind of a behavioral short term is there, maybe something is evokes new. Yeah, I would love to hear from you. Um, look, I have met all kinds of farmers. Like, I mean, one of the things that we do is, you know, a lot of documenting jump in farmer stories and understanding why somebody changed their behavior and why they didn't. And mostly, obviously, we've seen change happen with medium to large farmers. You know, small stakeholder, small farmers are far and few between, but I've met farmers, uh, you know, I've seen, you know, we all know that they overuse fertilizers. For example, a smallholder farmer will spend more money on like two rounds of fertilizers when they could have used just half, that kind of thing. So there's certainly, it's not just even the short term horizon. Like if you could do the math with them, they would understand or the budgeting with them or something, they'd say, I don't need to be wasting this money, right? So sometimes it's just a short term sort of intervention to say, let's save you money. Let's figure out exactly how much fertilizer you need to use. And believe me, there is no risk in this process. So that kind of, when they know that there's no risk and there's only a reward that they've saved it, then that, that's a solution. There are farmers I've seen. Uh, in fact, there's a, uh, there's a couple that I met in Madhya Pradesh who were day wage day laborers, you know, somewhere in Delhi. One day they went back and they literally bought a kind of a barren, or almost a fallow land, right? Like totally degraded type of a land. And when we are like, and today they're like a thriving, you know, um, uh, farmer uh, family, they've raised kids on that farm for the last 30 years, 20 years or something. And so I asked them like, what made you, so they began to put leaves into the, into the soil slowly and slowly. And they made the soil fertile literally by themselves with very tiny savings, almost none. And they said, well, we knew this practice, you know, there were my, you know, past farmers who our, our grandparents used to tell us and we were from this village and we had left and now we wanted to buy this and this is the only land that was available but we knew we needed to put this so they kept like so they're huge mulching champions right because they keep on kept on mulching until it became fertile and now they're growing everything so there are so many stories uh, that we can't just kind of break it down into whether this is a short-term thinking, long-term thinking. Again, this is where nuances really come in, right? Understanding the context of them and seeing what are the least cost inputs they could put in to improve fertility and how could we convince them of doing that and what is the simplest thing we could do to just reduce their cost right now and are we willing to make that effort genuinely this is where the morality of it comes in are we as a team or can we push our funders or somebody to make the effort to allow for that extra you know two months to work with them to see whether they could be convinced so uh, I don't know. If we, we all know the short term versus long term horizon issues in terms of you know risk taking, etc. But I'm just talking about the nuances that one could work with. No, I, I mean, I mean, I understand. I think it's a uh, it's, it's understandable. The reason, see, the one of the reasons where we do these kind of conversations also is primarily to sort of look at this whole spectrum there, right? Because because uh, like you said, many of the, the folks. Uh, I mean, like your what whatever your criticism you had about IT tech is very well taken, right? Because it's what is is the reality we know. Uh, and, and to a large extent, you know, uh, and, I, and I think, you know, it's again a question of, it's, it's again, I, mean, I don't want to justify whatever they're doing it, but it's for them, the question of, you know, for them, they are so well and they get into this trap and then they go into that game there, right? right? I mean, leave aside that, the question is always is in terms of in what ways can we sort of help them see the bigger picture? Right? Can we help the, uh, connect the different dots there? And, and that's where some of these conversations are also being shared with the community and with the people at large to kind of see that, you know, this, this is not just this, this small universe that we all live in. There is multiple universes that, that, that are there. And, and and that's where maybe to to take into what Vivek's earliest question was, uh, yeah, we, we would love to, you know, we have a 
very group different diverse group of people uh today you know the, the, today we will and vivek showed up but there are other people who are con who, who very regularly tune in into the and listening to these conversations there so i'm sure each of them would have some ways to sort of engage in there but if there's any specific ways you think you know this community could be of help in terms of scaling some of these things i mean quote unquote scaling uh without necessarily dumping it down uh because that's a common understanding of scale there right but whereas in nature it, it scales and it, it intelligently increases so so in that way if there's any way where we could this ecosystem and community could be of help we would love to do that because you know i mean and that's the, the whole point of this conversation as well you know i think i think uh, i mean one of the most important ones is you know uh, figuring out how to just increase the uh, the you know the dissemination of the games and tools that we have to be relevant to certain geographies and then helping figuring out whether we can you know uh, figure out where to get the resource for the languages and for the socio cultural you know um, motifs and things that have to be changed to make those things more acceptable so that is definitely one one place and uh, um certainly women i mean we are obviously i'm a woman led company and we women have a very important role to play in everything that we do and even within the karabara tool and everywhere we've always presented women as the lead farmer because we want to try to really bring that into you know the climate resilience kind of center of that climate resilience effort is, is the women uh, so figuring out really honestly really just tapping into the knowledge and the wisdom that your community holds and figuring out how to really do more to put women in the center of this change making if it's not just the farmers but it's the advocates who work with the farmers the community resource people and really just building the capacity figuring out how to embed the tools that we have within the kvk networks figuring out how to just build the capacity it's almost as if like we need to do that leapfrogging of everybody you know like we did from we went from the regular phone to a smartphone very very quickly within india you know or a remote phone is the same way we need to quickly go past the narrative go past the things the things that little simple bottlenecks so that we can get to the actual bottleneck right this is a behavior and figuring out how to just figure out how to solve this immediately in the next 5 years so i don't know maybe we can all work on a brainstormer session and figure that out figure out how to harness your wisdom our tools bring them together and scaling things up yeah sure i mean we would love to uh, explore that possibility there because i think i think uh, i mean the, there are various people you know in this ecosystem there is not just from india there so there are other learnings and also there uh, you know we uh, we've had i think i think from uh, natural farming i mean kartikeyan from ntp and uh, vishala vishala is also a member of the uh, agribusiness matters community so we have people who been sort of looking at some of these there so so yeah we'll 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 figure a way to see how we can sort of cross pollinate some of these possibilities there and and do that i know you have a hard stop at 8:30 uh i'll i'll we'll sort of let you go from all our ramblings in there and <laughs> the conversations there thank you very very much uh uh and and really 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 enjoyed uh, talking to you and 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 i'm feeling very and nourished by this conversation there because at the end of the day you know each of us are striving to create uh, like we like we like we were discussing right the only only antidote to despondency is some sense of hope and create and building that hope in a certain fractal way with the hope that it it probably the fractal then becomes the whole in some sense so uh i think that's where each of us are striving in uh yeah I'll, i if there's any anything last comments we make and we'll have to make and yeah we can we can with that we'll close that yeah thank you very much for all the knowledge and but yeah i hope we, we can find some way to, to help each other as well uh, same here uh love the fact that we brought a game into this uh talking about behavioral science i think these are all great things uh which we we hope to contribute if not support from the sidelines uh in whichever way possible and thank you very much for your time thank you so much thank you so much all of you thank you venkat for putting this together and uh, i look forward to joining the community and learning more from all of you thank you so thank you very very much and i also want to add quickly add that will is also sort of you know from from the work he's doing in from europe and and then is also trying to build a region and business there so i think some of these learnings could very well go to the protesting farmers in uh, in europe currently so so we'll we'll hope that <laughs> yeah, please, if you want the game for them to play we can uh, arrange that for you <laughs> sounds good here yeah. we need that in the us as well yeah yeah all right then thank you very much thanks sir thank uh, thanks everyone see you all
Thank you. Bye. Yes, we'll bye. 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 bye.